uh, before he speaks, we're going to show the movie Carl Hess, Towards Liberty. And he has about a five minute explanation of the movie before it's shown. So now I would like to introduce you to the man we all love to love, Carl Hess. I've just got to explain <laughs> my part in it. I, it's about me, but I didn't make it. Uh, it did win the Academy Award and the Cannes Film Festival and all that sort of thing. But there's several things in it I really need to explain. It was made a long time ago, 1980, and uh, there's some mysterious things in it. There's a reference in it uh, that appears to be antagonistic to space travel. And there's a, a, a reference in it that appears to be antagonistic to disposable razors for some strange reason. Well, these were just visual symbols that the filmmakers plucked out of uh, midair as part of a discussion we were having about the fact that I abhor the notion that the, the state is operating the space program. It will not be successful until merchant adventurers. Uh, are, are doing it. But a bunch of lieutenant colonels in space doesn't exactly thrill me. And I, I don't think that NASA is the highest uh, height to which men have ever aspired. And on the disposable thing, that ca uh, the, uh, the razors, that came out of a discussion of General Motors, oddly enough. And I was talking about their really primitive managerial system. And somehow or another, the razors got into it. Don't ask me how, so overlook that. Then there's a phrase in it that I know is going to uh, cause a number of people in here to want to lynch me immediately, uh, where it refers to uh, people who wanted to, uh, want to live in a democratic society, uh, not, not letting tools get away from them. That if their politics are democratic and participatory, uh, they would want their industry to be. That does not mean that I believe <laughs> in communism. It simply came out of a discussion that I had in which I said, I personally would not have an employee. I don't trust employees, nor would I want to be an employer because employees don't trust employers. And that if you're going to get anything really uh, done, particularly in a, in a high technology, environment, you need everybody to be a participant in the industry. They have to take ex uh, equal risks, and they have, to have, uh, they have to have responsibilities. I think the whole concept of employee is, is, is gradually dying. I mean, who needs them? What we need are fully participating human beings who are willing to take risks at every level of an organization. So that's, what, that's how that came about. Uh, and the space travel thing, as I said, I'm enthusiastic about space travel and we'll be talking about it a lot. And there may be some other things in there, God, I don't know, that you're going to absolutely hate. Uh, but the thing is, I, I, I honestly, I am sort of a libertarian. <laughs> Although I've failed almost every purity test that has been devised. But I don't foam at the mouth and I don't work for the IRS. So... Uh, there's still hope even for me. And uh, I guess you should look at the film now. We do have one of our vice, uh, pres our vice presidential candidate here who will be speaking tomorrow, Andre Moreau. Will you stand up so they can see you? And I just noticed someone else who came here from out of state, Dennis Kirk. Dennis, would you stand up? They came from Minnesota. Is there anyone I missed that I'm not? I don't have my glasses on. I lost. Lloyd Stark. Huh? Lloyd Stark. Lloyd Stark from Eugene, Oregon. <laughs> if someone would come in during that marvelous movie, we uh, we have the projector for tonight only. If anyone chooses to watch it when we're through for the evening, let me know, and we can just run it again. Have any dignitaries come in <laughs> during the movie? I did hear the door open a couple times. Any of our future speakers, have they arrived that I can't quite see? 
Okay, we will now go into our first talk for the evening, Carl Hess. Let me just uh, continue with some of the observations in, in that I'll be talking about these things specifically at, at various times in this marathon. But uh, when I talk about appropriate technology, that film was made for a very specific purpose. My notion of appropriate technology includes the following things. Genetic engineering, nanotechnology, cybernetics of all sorts, and, and any electronic machine that I've ever met. I'm not opposed to nuclear energy as a technology. I am certainly opposed to it as the first authentically socialist power source on this continent. And I feel that people who are so what, I feel that even among libertarians there is a, a tendency to hate anything that hippies like. <laughs> and reverse, to love anything that hippies hate. And uh, I don't believe all libertarians are immune to this uh, visceral reaction. And so they, they look on a nuclear energy and they say hippies hate it, it must be good, not understanding that it is, it is actually the first great penetration of a socialist uh, power source in this country. It can't be denied and it's, it's, it's certainly used as a continuing excuse and will be. I mean, the first time one terrorist uh, hits a nuclear power plant, the national security the laws that will follow that will make all of the ones that uh, Reagan has put in so far look absolutely uh, benign. There, everything is, uh, needs to be looked at politically, as a matter of fact, because politics is made out of all of these things by politicians. Well, I just wanted to, to clear that up, too. We'll talk about tools uh, regularly. I think uh, tonight we're talking about the practice of liberty. And I would, uh, I start this out by saying this is, first of all, all of these things are, are simply my notions of how things work. And if anybody uh, chooses to take them seriously, that is their, their own decision. And uh, caveat emptor is the rule here. And if you believe anything I say, uh, that means that you aren't doing research, you should check it. I don't expect anybody to believe it or pay attention to it, but you're in the position where you have to listen to it, which again is your fault, not mine. <laughs> and uh, so I'll proceed on the understanding that these are just observations that I make. I am not an ideologue, in case <laughs> that hasn't become clear. Liberty is not an ideology so far as I'm concerned, it's a way of living. And so my first observation is that liberty is a personal and individual project. The purpose of liberty is not to save Western civilization. It is not to pass something on to future generations. In my view, it is none of these things. Liberty is the project of an individual being free. And that it's an immediate project. To delay it in order to pass it on to somebody three generations in the future that you haven't met is not going to do that generation much good, I believe, and it certainly won't do you much good. I mean, history is yours, not society's. You don't belong to society. You don't belong to the future. You live only in the present, and for a miserably short amount of time, when you get right down to it, uh, and so your project, it seems to me, in liberty is immediate and highly individual. If, for practical purposes, it occurs to you that the spread of liberty is an important component of your liberty, then it is prudent for you to spread it as much as possible. And my impression is that people who are in the Libertarian Party have taken the view that there are important things to be accomplished politically to protect themselves against political power. And I believe this is prudent and that people who do it are following a perfectly prudent course. People who don't follow that course, on the other hand, are not to be reviled uh, in any sense. They simply don't agree with you. And so they do something else. So long as what they do does not 
curb your freedom. They are your friends. Leonard Liggio, who is one of the wisest of libertarians I've always felt, has a very simple rule uh, for friends. He says, if they won't call the police on me, they are very probably my friends. And that's a, that's a crude enough thing for me because I live in, I live in a, a, a non-ideological but lawless state, uh, West Virginia, where there is a culture of liberty, but no philosophy of liberty. It's visceral, it's uh, natural uh, to people there, and I respect this. I do not demand of my neighbors, who are very libertarian in action, I certainly do not demand of them an explanation of their epistemological approach to it. First place, uh, they and I don't know what that means. Uh, what I really uh, ask of my neighbors is that they act as though they respect liberty. Now, I ask you about this other business. Suppose you do know someone who has the absolutely perfect line on all matters pertaining to liberty, the philosophical line, they're perfect. In short, their opinion is perfect. Well, I suggest to you that there are people of perfect opinion who from time to time do not act perfectly. Because a person has an opinion of something does not tell you everything about that person. You learn about people, and particularly about their devotion to liberty, not by listening to their opinions, which can change. I mean, people undergo extraordinary changes uh, for a million dollars, for instance. Or, cruder than that, they undergo extraordinary changes when somebody starts uh, crushing their hand or when electrodes are attached to their scrotum, and they're shocked. They can have instant conversions. No matter what their opinions are, what you really need to know then is about the character of people, how they behave, whether they are libertarian under stress, whether they talk about it but do little, and that sort of thing. This, to me, is terribly important in terms of the practice of liberty. This is entirely separate, in my mind, from the opinion of liberty. They may go together, but it is not inevitable, and it is not necessary that they go together. There are people who can talk to you endlessly about the very finest points of, of libertarian activity and who may be working for the Defense Department, for all I know. Well, now, I respect their opinion. And I'd certainly like to know what they're doing in the Defense Department. They might even be good libertarians. They might be what Liggio, again, describes as briefcase gorillas. You just don't know about people. But at any rate, I, I return to the central point of my observation, which is that liberty is not a collective enterprise. Collectivism in any form is not part of it. It is an individual enterprise. And I quote, uh, I'm very fond of pointing out that this attitude is not confined to any traditional political faction. Both Ayn Rand, a heroic woman, and Emma Goldman, a heroic woman, one who called herself a capitalist and one who called herself a communist, an anarcho-communist, both have said exactly the same thing in terms, in these terms, that the entire history of the human race is in effect the story of the struggle of the individual against institutions. And I believe this to be true, that this individual enterprise of liberty has persisted throughout time. It has been unvarying. It's always been the same. And that people who have had varying opinions of other things have had similar opinions of that one thing. I believe, as a matter of fact, that liberty is the central uh, condition for being human. That people who choose to not be responsible for their own actions, people who believe that they belong to society, uh, people who, uh, who are collectivist in every reflex, 
of their lives. That is to say that they do not regard the individual as significant, but only groups of individuals. And uh, in, in the worst cases, uh, uh, the political groups of individuals. That these people are subhuman in a, in a very real way. They have chosen not to exercise the most significant faculty of human beings, which is to be independent, to be creative, to respond to emergencies as individuals, uh, and to make decisions about their associations as individuals. Now, chipmunks do a number of, of things that non-humans who look like people uh, do. You know, they, they act reflexively in all situations. They're predictable. Uh, I guess you could say they have a perfect ideology. They jump when they hear loud noises, and so forth and so on. They do not do those things that are impressive uh, about human beings. Now, one of the things that, uh, in that film that I was talking about was, was today's uh, uh, commercial and mass production technology. I benefit from it, I have no objection to it, but I can tell you this that it does not take a very smart person to look at the world today and understand that particularly for this, the most advanced technological nation on the face of the earth, that those days are gone. That we have no capacity uh, to compete with third world mass production. That we have something else on our agenda, obviously. This will be, I predict, and I, I intrude now on what I will talk about in tools, but. This will be clearly, it seems to me, an industrial society of custom industries, of small-scale, incredibly high-tech, a customized uh, industry. I can't believe that General Motors can survive another decade against the pressure of people who do mass production so much better and have better people to do it with, people who have not yet learned the excitement of being human. Uh, uh, and that's okay with me, but I would imagine that in this country, within a decade, the automobile industry may start spawning and soon be dominated by custom uh, production of automobiles. So you go in and ask, design your car, and it'll, it can be built in a week, and you can pick it up. Now, of course, what stands in the way of this? Ralph Nader and the U.S. government. <laughs> yes. Nader, of course, won't be happy with a customized car, because there aren't 22,000 of them to put through stress tests. So I think the government won't like it at all because Nader doesn't like it, that's the first thing. And uh, beside which, uh, General Motors won't like it. Uh, and as you will observe, the affinity of the federal government uh, and General Motors is uh, fairly obvious. I'm so struck, oh, I, I keep thinking of all the things I want to talk about later, but. Just to intrude immediately, Ross Perot's comments on the management of General Motors were the most refreshing, and I think really essentially libertarian comments that anybody has made lately. But, uh, when you get right down to it, look at Perot. I, he's a Democrat, I guess, and I, I guess he couldn't make it into the Libertarian Party because uh, he'd certainly fail the, uh, the morals test in, in one way or another. I, I squeaked in on a bunch of waivers that are so long. <laughs> but here is a man of what? What does he do? First, he's a billionaire. That strikes me as a great recommendation. I am so incredibly tired of poverty-stricken libertarians. Uh, I mean, it's not... I am poor, but I, I am, I'm not poor in any sense that I could recognize as being a privation, I live like a millionaire. I don't happen to have a million dollars, thanks to the government, <laughs> but that's no excuse for not living uh, rich. I mean, that's, that's part of this thing, you know. Here is this great world. And part of the practice of liberty, it occurs to me, is to either be filthy rich, although I don't believe that that's a good adjective for it, it is to be superbly rich or to be creatively poor. It's the middle part <laughs> that gives all sorts of terrible problems. And I tell you, I honestly think that a person operating in the free market today has little excuse for being, not being one or the other, either being quite rich or creatively poor. I mean, it's there. My 
God, this is a world of absolutely and totally unlimited opportunity. And I believe that the practice of liberty requires that people, uh, people who, who, who love the free market, I believe it requires that they, uh, it's sort of an imperative, I think, that they get, they get cracking in it. And, uh, well, this, you know, I, I, this is a terrible thing to be talking about among libertarians, but if you had to divide up your time between politics and getting rich, it occurs to me that you should make a prudent division. I mean, part of the purpose of libertarian politics is to beat back all of the political disincentives for the poorest people becoming rich, creating wealth. Now, you, but you can't do it all of the time. You have to have a prudent dis distribution of your time. You spend a certain amount of time attacking state power, which you have to do through politics. Incidentally, I agree with this proposition of the Libertarian Party, that that's the way you do it. I mean, uh, the notion that you're going to do it by stocking up on automatic weapons and suddenly go storm the, uh, the Winter Palace or something is, uh, is just silly business. Uh, I mean, every, many people in this room have had professional experience uh, with, uh, w with uh, the force of arms. Mine was with the 8th Armored Division, and I tell you, they're good at it. The state is very good at violence, and you folks are. And I'm not. But what are we good at? We're good at being merchants and adventurers. And that's where, that's where our great strength lies. And then our prudent responsibility is to take political action to guard ourselves. I look at the Libertarian Party in many ways today. Uh, one way is that it is the largest, awe-inspiring and some little depressing, it is the largest organized, constituent, organized constituency for the free market in the United States. Now that's both sad, but we're stuck with it. The fact that there's so few, uh, of course that just means organized. See, there are probably millions of more people who are enthusiastic about the free market who aren't organized. But here's an organized group. And that's terribly important to have such organization. It is also the only political approach that has as its uh, proposition uh, gaining political office in order to educate and to beat back political power. Now, a libertarian who sought and gained office in order to pass laws would have ceased to be a libertarian at the outset and would be the sort of villain that people who hate the party say all party people are. But that's, that's a terrible generalization. I know a lot of people in the Libertarian Party who are honestly seeking offices in order to protect themselves and to protect other people against the disincentives to wealth creation that the state puts up at every level. I believe them, I believe they're sincere, and I think it's prudent to do it. Now, there are some people who take the view that the Libertarian Party itself is the greatest enemy. And I find this uh, an odd uh, position because I don't see how the Libertarian Party uh, qualifies uh, as nearly uh, pernicious or as violent as, let's say, the, uh, the CIA. Uh, the Strategic Air Command, the KGB, uh, the Sandinista government, any government. <laughs> I mean, these are really, uh, these, uh, these are very violent uh, people, and they, they, they are really out to hurt you. Oh my God, is the Libertarian Party out to hurt anyone? I haven't seen such activity. How, how is it that it arouses such incredible animosity from some people who say that it must be destroyed first before AIDS uh, <laughs> or the IRS? I, I, don't, I don't understand that. I've not always been an enthusiastic uh, supporter of the party. Uh, I, I've spent most of my time at libertarian gatherings, uh, gatherings chiding and... and, and bitching about things, all that, but never once in my wildest dreams 
have I thought of the Libertarian Party or any Libertarian as being uh, my enemy? How could they possibly be? I mean, even now I know some, some people who, because I've joined the Libertarian Party, I actually joined it without even knowing it, that somebody <laughs> joined me up in it. Uh, <laughs> but, but how can I know some people who, who think now that I suddenly uh, uh, am on the, uh, uh, the 10 most wanted list or something? As though everything I've done in my life, everything that I do in my life, suddenly is unimportant. The fact that I signed a piece of paper that said that I do not believe in the initiation of force to accomplish personal or, or, or political aims has suddenly made me an enemy? How, how curious. I would think it would have made me a very pussycat and that no one would fear me now because I have sworn publicly that I don't believe in the initiation of force. Now, do the libertarians who hate the Libertarian Party believe in the initiation of force? That's a curious thing. Apparently, not generally, but only in terms of the Libertarian Party. It's a strange uh, exception that we have here. Uh, we don't use force against the IRS, uh, but we might use it against the Libertarian Party. It's most peculiar. And I hope that that ends because it's a, it's a terrible waste of everybody's time. So long as there is one internal revenue agent left alive on the face of this planet, there is no libertarian on the planet who can possibly be counted as an enemy greater than that last surviving fugitive IRS agent. <laughs> and I just... I just wish that libertarians could understand that uh, uh, they waste their time and everybody else's time when they fight each other. I mean, good God, what a waste, what, an, what a terror, what an unconscionable waste. I mean, I, I, when I started editing the Libertarian Party News, which has been an unbroken uh, anguish uh, for me, because I've learned a lot more about libertarians than I ever wanted to know. <laughs> and I try to put it out of my mind. Uh, uh, among other things, as I've told several people, I've told Jim Turney I will never attend a national committee meeting. Uh, because I, I really do not care to know that much about libertarians. But uh, from the time I came in, people would uh, keep telling me about who I should hate. You know, well, this person's this, this person's that. There's this incredible rivalry that goes on. You know, as though every person's faction was in fact the libertarian movement. How idiotic. The Libertarian Party isn't the Libertarian Movement. Uh, agorism isn't. Uh, spacism isn't. God, nothing is. The movement's the movement. It's a bunch of individuals. There is no such thing as the movement. There are a lot of individuals who are involved in a movement. And praise be. Now, Nomus, for instance. I think Nomus is one of the, if not the, outstanding libertarian publication in the country. I mean, I would cheerfully say if somebody said, well, let's send it to everybody instead of the Libertarian Party News, I'd say, that's a hell of a good idea. Uh, on the other hand, I like proliferation, so I think there's room for both of us, as a matter of fact. But if we spent one minute trying to put either of us out of business, we would be, I believe, wasting great energy that could be better expended in other ways. I, I wish for every libertarian of every faction growing success. I mean, even, uh, uh, even I have a close relationship with uh, the agorists and I'm on their board of advisors and so forth and sometimes a little awkward to, uh, to meet with Sam Conkin and have to uh, uh, hear the, the five-minute diatribe on why the Libertarian Party should be destroyed, uh, but, <laughs> but it usually doesn't last much longer. I wish him the greatest success in every enterprise that he undertakes except that one, because I cannot imagine how we could, any of us would be benefited by destroying the activities of any other of us. 
people choose to do different things. And God, if that isn't part of liberty, what is? I mean, there isn't, people say, oh, gross, we can't have a bunch of hippies in here. Shit. I mean, suppose you have a bunch of hippies and they decide voluntarily to be hippies and have a commune and a good look, do, do all sorts of weird things, practice charity, uh, <laughs> be kind to one another, uh, things like that. What the hell difference does it make? You know, they're not going to force you to do it. I've often thought that, as a matter of fact, cannibalism is a good it's a perfectly acceptable voluntary activity if the entree is a volunteer. <laughs> what possible difference does it make whether a bunch of people do that? Well, if I can entertain that level of tolerance, it would be very strange to uh, uh, be intolerant of somebody who just had a different view of, uh, good Lord, I don't know, Austrian economics or something like that, or, or somebody who's a Sternerite instead of an Afterite or something. This is just crazy business. Who cares? I mean, we've seen what it has done to Christians as they begin to uh, boil uh, their entire rich religious heritage down to bickerings uh, between sects and factions. I hope it doesn't happen to libertarians. Well, I guess that's just by way of saying that I, I honestly take seriously the notion that, that every individual should be uh, free to do absolutely anything that they want so long as they do not curb the freedom of anyone else to do ex uh, exactly as they please. And I, I take very seriously that, uh, that one uh, point that Libertarian Party members are asked to agree to. It occurs to me that it should supersede, as a matter of fact, the entire platform. I mean, when you simply say that you do not believe in the initiation of force, you have stated a principle from which, with great exactitude, can be extrapolated a position on any other thing that happens on the face of the earth. I mean, you don't have to have a, a, a conference to tell you what that extrapolates to in terms of a coercive taxation, the drag, uh, laws about uh, what you do in your bedroom or consequently with your body, these are all, all very clear uh, once that, uh, that position is agreed on. I think it's a perfectly fine thing to agree on. I know some people who, who feel it would be wise not to even agree on that, but uh, I don't know. I, I assume that people who get together either They'll figure out some unique costume to wear or a ritual to have, or they'll have a, something else to unite them. Otherwise, why do they get together? You know, you get together because, well, everybody wears a blue shirt. Everybody believes that they shouldn't initiate force. That's pretty good. Now, once you get beyond that, uh, <laughs> the world is, is, is open-ended, isn't it? Seems to me it is. Well, at any rate, the practice, I feel, then, of liberty is very individual in nature. It is not an ideological practice, although people may explain the way they act by explaining an ideological position. And that's, that's an honorable thing to do. On the other hand, it is not absolutely required that you explain why you do things to everybody who comes along. Some people might choose just to do it. Uh, as long as they do it, the doing of it is, uh, is, is quite good, whether they uh, have these principles or not. I guess I have a low uh, regard for opinion because of having seen how in times of great peril and stress, people's opinions uh, change so rapidly, whereas their characters may not. And so I, uh, I, I look to what people do the way they treat people, how, whether they honor contracts. I mean, these are important things. I mean, there are certainly, you know, everyone in this room probably knows or knows of someone who has looked them straight in the eyes and told them what a wonderful libertarian they are and then cheated them or stolen from them. It, it has happened time after time and it occurs to me it teaches a powerful lesson that people can tell you one thing and do something else. 
And if you have your choice between observing what a person does and just listening to what a person says, you're prudent. You're simply prudent in observing actions. They're terribly important. Well, the practice of freedom then, in terms of the Libertarian Party. What do I think about that? Well, I've been told in no uncertain terms uh, by some of the most august members of the Libertarian Party that I have no right to think about it. Uh, I forget the details of the denunciation, but it was very thorough and uh, <laughs> has to do something well and at any rate, but I do think about it. And I think this about the Libertarian Party. I think one, it should stick to its notion of being a political party, that that's terribly important. If it wanted to call itself something else, it should call itself something else. A political party is a political party. And if you don't like politics, you shouldn't be in it. And then there's not, nothing wrong with that. A lot of people don't like politics. But once in it, you're in politics. And you are, ta you are taking political action. Now, if that it strikes you as being sinful, you should get out. And no one should criticize you for it, for getting in or for getting out. Because it is, it is the sort of decision that you can make without hurting anyone else to get in or get out. But once in, my preference, and this is purely a preference, is to concentrate on local activities as much as possible. I understand that the presidential election has a, a powerful uh, tutelary uh, role to play. And I don't, I, I think it's, as a matter of fact, it has helped build the party. But I believe that is probably, uh, and, I, and Andre is a, is a superb elucidator of, of this point. And I've learned a lot from, from what he has written about it. The purpose of the election is essentially to build the party. Uh, and it builds the party by letting people know about it, by stating the principles and positions that are uh, that stem from the uh, the party's basic statement. These uh, these are very important, but in the long run, where things get done are at the local level, uh, as you are as you are proving, you'll be able to do more. Now, you will be able to do more now because of this elected position you have. And you'll be reviled by some libertarians, I'm sure, for being a, an ally of the state. And you could, be down, you could be down at the Capitol every day, digging, it, uh, digging out a hole under it, planting dynamite in it, and they would still denounce you for it. So you just can't let that bother you. What you have got to do is use your position now uh, to talk about things. And, you, and people will listen more now, much more than ever before. And you can say things that can be increasingly outrageous. I trust not originally outrageous, because uh, there's, a, there's a delicate nature to this business of bringing people along to the idea that it is even possible to be free, to be responsible for your own actions. It's really alien for so many people. After all, we have been brought up, most of us, in government schools. We have been taught carefully and powerfully that we are incompetent. And if we didn't learn the lesson well, uh, if we stayed in these government schools long enough, we would be uh, uh, functionally incompetent anyway. It's a self-fulfilling uh, proposition. But you'll have, a, you'll have a great chance. Now you can blow it by being silly at the outset. You know, and saying that uh, uh, what you want to do is, is immediately uh, have the freedom for people to commit sodomy on the Capitol steps or something, which may be your eventual position, uh, <laughs> but shouldn't, shouldn't be your original one. <laughs> In short, people, people generally uh, do not find the notions of the Founding Fathers comfortable today. And we should understand this. When the Declaration of Independence is circulated uh, generally, as it was at an American air base in Germany a while back, well, I'll tell you what happened there. It was circulated at the air base, where America's finest were protecting the Germans, uh, <laughs> who lost the war, you may recall. 
uh, from the Russians who won the war or something. But at any rate, they passed the Declaration of Independence around. They asked two questions. One, would you sign it? And two, who wrote it? And I, uh, I hate to tell you, but the answer to would you sign it was overwhelmingly no. And the answer to who wrote it was overwhelmingly Lenin. Well, <laughs> you know, we have a long way to go. As a matter of fact, the principles of the Declaration of Independence are totally forgotten. Uh, we celebrate uh, many things. We celebrate the, uh, the birthday of it, but not the text of it. I mean, good heavens, suppose you, you, you wrote out on a, a wall that when government exceeds uh, certain limits, it should be abolished? Well, you know, that counts as sedition in a number of jurisdictions. You can go to jail uh, for saying what Thomas Jefferson said. So we, we do have a long way to go, and it should be borne in mind. And I believe that we should, as practitioners of liberty, become very aware of the anguish that a number of our neighbors are going through now in an era of incredible change. So that we have uh, fundamentalist neighbors, Republican neighbors, Democrat neighbors, neighbors of all sorts who see their world slipping away as though built on sand, just drifting away from them. And of course they're scared. And of course they're vindictive. And of course they will fight you. They really require not your sarcasm, particularly. They so, certainly don't require a holier-than-thou attitude. And they certainly don't deserve or require insults. What they require is a patient effort on your part to explain the possibilities of liberty. They also, I believe, could demand on your part a constant demonstration of the difference between a person who believes in personal responsibility and a person who believes in collective responsibility. I suggested in a recent issue of the Libertarian Party News that, for instance, libertarians who possess an incredible amount of, of information and knowledge would do very well to offer technical advice to self-help groups in poor neighborhoods. Well, now, I understand that there is a fashion among some libertarians to simply say, poor people, uh, you know, oh, ha, 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 let's make hamburger out of them. <laughs> uh, you know, this, this, there's, an, there's a graffiti, I, I think of them as graffiti libertarians. The idea is to say something that will shock everybody, uh, like, like scribbling shit on the wall or something. You want to shock people. You just want to be a smart ass about it. So you say, well the hell, let them eat cake, and blah, blah, blah. But this is really not enough. I mean, we're talking about something serious here. It's not a child's game, this liberty. People die for it. People live for it. It's not just a, a series of insults traded back and forth among people. So there are people who are poor largely because of the intervention of the state. It is one of our propositions that wealth can be created if the state will simply get off people's backs. Well, in an attempt to demonstrate that, I believe it is important to take such actions as offering technical assistance to self-help groups. How else to prove it? Otherwise, we rant and we rave and we do not demonstrate. I will be suggesting in the future, should there be a future for me in the, in the Libertarian Party, which is always an exciting thing to open my mail, uh, 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 I can't see it's lasting much beyond Seattle, but uh, nonetheless, in, in, in some future things, I, I, I want to suggest, and I'll suggest it somewhere else, if it's not there, uh, that uh, child care, daycare, is a very important political issue that's about to inundate us. The socialists in this country are going to make it, un I should say what, the social democrats, you name them, whoever they are, they're going to make a very major issue out of this. And we can't duck it, and you can't simply say, oh, it's evil, because it'll work. If they do it, it'll work. You'll pay for it. The police power will be increased. Liberty will be lost, but it'll work. 
you know, they've got enough money to, to keep making it work. So what is the defense against it? It occurs to me the defense against, against it is for libertarians to organize as quickly as possible as much free market child care as possible. It's a big political issue. It's a big opportunity, as a matter of fact. There are millions to be made in it, but even as importantly, there's politics to be made out of it. That's a very important one. Well, so is everything. I've often said, uh, and not facetiously, just romantically, I guess, that I, it would be more useful for a libertarian to invent a cure for cancer than to enunciate some new principle of, of economic interpretation. Because this would be very impressive. And people might listen to this person more uh, than if they were just another uh, theoretician in politics. So I think this would be a very important thing to do. I think it might be pleasant also if the person who invented it said that it would be available only to people who would sign this card. <laughs> But perhaps that's, that's going overboard a bit. <laughs> but I, I, my meaning there is that the practice of liberty is entirely too important to simply let it, uh, simply let it become a series of delightful debates. I mean, if, as a matter of fact, your only purpose in, in devoting yourself to liberty is because it's, uh, uh, it's a fancier way to talk than most of your neighbors, uh, you could do other things. You could go on the stage, become a rock star. Uh, there are other ways to set yourself off in your neighborhood. This liberty thing is, is just too important uh, uh, to, be, to be merely a conversation piece, uh, to be merely a, uh, a recreation. It's not a recreation. I mean, it occurs to me that uh, unless you are so devoted to it, that you, this is my test in a way I feel, maybe it'll be useful for you. Therese and I both have, have felt for a number of years that we could walk out of the house that we built uh, with what we could carry and go somewhere, anywhere, and be one, as happy as we were, to create wealth, uh, be responsible for our own actions. We could make it. Anywhere, anywhere on the face of the earth, under any known circumstances that we can think of, there's something exciting about that, and it, it means I have this great sense that liberty is available already for people if it is their preoccupying uh, personal project. Well, that's uh, you know, it's, it's a personal thing. People uh, have to think about themselves. But I'll tell you this, so long as the state can control those things which you feel your character and personality de depend on, status, any sort of thing of that sort, you're not free. And they can always grab you in some way. Uh, I believe that to be free in a status society finally means that you're prepared to stand naked uh, at uh, Fifth and Main Street if necessary and tell anybody who passes by that you just, uh, unfortunately, the government has just taken your clothes, but you intend to uh, be unembarrassed. You intend to walk away and live your life and that you cannot be stripped of your essential individuality that nothing you have, own, or do uh, is as important as that, that's that one thing, that you alone in the universe are you, and that uh, there's never going to be another one. There never was another one. You're totally uh, separate, in a way. You're a member of a race, but you're a member. You know, <laughs> you're, not a, you're not a cog. You're not a cell in it, you're an individual. And this precious thing, I think this precious definition is, is simply, uh, means that you also have the potential to be free and to practice liberty. Well, 
ramblings, ramblings, ramblings. Um, if anybody has, uh, at this point, uh, a discussion or, or things, I, I would much prefer to do that. I, I just ramble on. Hello. You started your remarks about um, your abhorrence about institutions, large, large institutions, mm -hmm. large. Um, in the absence of laws, what kind of self-regulating mechanisms do you see would be there to uh, mm -hmm. prevent large institutions from functioning and coercing? Well, I believe that the large institutions have, and incidentally, it's not, the, it's not simply the size that bothers me. I mean, big, I don't think big is bad. It's simply that, that any institution that, well, has these characteristics. One, it, it, it outlives the individuals who are part of it. That's, that's, that's a, a first uh, annoyance about big institutions. And secondly, uh, institutions of scale uh, begin to, to act as though the purpose of the institution is the perpetuation of the institution. Uh, and that people within it begin to subordinate their individual interests to it. They become collectivists. You know, big and small. Uh, nationalism is collectivism, for instance. And so is loyalty. All of these things are, are collectivist in nature. And so my objection is not to the absolute size, but to the organizational imperatives that occur in it. Now, as for the absence of law, I doubt if there ever will be an absence of law in the sense that I doubt if there'll be an absence of agreements uh, between people. But uh, there's, uh, there's a, a fair amount of experience with the absence of formal law. For instance, mining camps in, in the Western United States, uh, which had fair populations, uh, had no formal law, but they had uh, formal law, but they did have law. That is to say, miners' courts were extraordinary, it seems to me, in, in that they were spontaneous expressions of a respect for evidence. That is, people presented evidence, people disputed it, and, and judgments were made on the basis of... So there seems to be a practical recognition by most people that if you're going to have adjudications, uh, you require information. Well, a lot of information, uh, a lot more information is certainly available today than ever before because uh, first of all, in, in inner city neighborhoods, for instance, you can observe what is going on. People live packed together so tightly that information is in, in almost oversupply. So you know who the criminals are, who the crooks are, and uh, I give you examples of, of the sort of informal law that I've, I've experienced, spontaneous law. The Black Panthers, uh, who, were, uh, who understood that heroin uh, heroin and the state's version of it, which is methadone, uh, was absolutely killing a lot of people in, in, in black neighborhoods, uh, had the practice of finding a, a, a dealer in one of these two drugs and taking pictures of the person uh, before and after they had discussed it with them. And uh, the police in a number of jurisdictions said that uh, this is a complicated moral issue, had said that they, they had made a, made a deeper uh, impress on, on drug dealing uh, than any official agency. Of course, the fact of the matter that the Panthers could never, could never accommodate, unfortunately, was that if the state had not intervened in the narcotics trade at the outset, there simply would not be a large social problem involving it because the, the large social problem involving it is the price structure. Uh, people steal and kill because of the, in, uh, the artificially inflated price. Uh, people don't do that about cigarettes, which are exactly, uh, perhaps a little more addictive than heroin. And yet because of a still, you know, not completely, but a much more free price structure, people don't rob and, and steal and uh, kill people over cigarettes or uh, even whiskey, which is not a free market, but a more free market. So, but about other things. I think that people make agreements as to how they want to live. I mean, consider a group of people who live in a condominium. They certainly will make different agreements about how they want to treat and adjudicate offenses and crimes than people who say who live in the valleys of West Virginia. We already have uh, very little law. 
in West Virginia. Very little law. We have the lowest crime rate in the country. And one of the reasons is that I haven't met anybody in West Virginia who thought it was the state's duty to protect them against thieves. They thought that it was their responsibility, and as a consequence, the marginal uh, hazards or cost, the marginal cost of being a criminal in West Virginia is very high. You know, you may, you may be intending to steal a television, and the marginal cost is the loss of the left side of your head uh, from a deer <laughs> rifle. Well, uh, most people, prudent people, and most people are prudent, I'm convinced, except sociopaths, and they badly need killing anyway. <laughs> so uh, this person has got to say, well, I want the television set very badly, but on the other hand, I hate the loss of the left side of my head. Uh, some people in West Virginia wouldn't miss it totally, but... <laughs> But I think this is the thing. There should be as much competition and uh, there should be as much a free market in law as there is in anything else because it's simply agreements that people make. And uh, Quakers would have a very simple agreement. No law, no uh, vindictive activity, no defense. And you know, that's, that's sort of self-regulating after a while. When they're the only people in town you can steal from, because they won't defend themselves, then the marginal cost of being a Quaker just goes sky high. <laughs> and you have to figure out how to be a Quaker without uh, any possessions whatsoever, which many Quakers would do, but that's fine. It tests the Quaker principle. And uh, it's a perfect world, it seems to me, if in all social relationships, you assume a free market in operation then I believe it's perfect, because people are perfect in the delicacy of the arrangements that they will make. I think, it's been my observation, and everywhere I've lived, that people make precise free market arrangements about social matters if they're free to do it. So I guess that's it. I, I, the answer is I have the foggiest idea of what would happen, <laughs> except that I have an infinite faith that people operating in a free market would do something. And I'd like to be there. Yeah. Can you probe this a little bit farther on the notion that we're about as free as we make up our minds to be? Mm -hmm. I'm frustrated by the far too prevalent victim mentality in my little carry that it says we need to have the state make it easier to be free. Have the state? Have the state make it easier to be free. Oh. Well, I don't, uh, do, you think, do you sense that's what it is? I, I have an idea that uh, people in the Libertarian Party aren't saying that they want the state to make it easy to be free. They, uh, well, by getting, by getting out of the way, when, when in fact that we, can, we can exercise a great deal more freedom than we do, uh, and, and the state becomes just oh, an yeah. well, a Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a prime irritation. Uh, for one thing, it is terribly inconvenient not to be able to own property, own it. And nobody in this country owns real property. They rent it. And this means that planning and uh, uh, even such things as communities is always made difficult. The other thing is that I understand that although I, I act in a, a reckless uh, manner and live in a very reckless manner, that at any minute, any minute, I can go to the, go to the penitentiary. It just requires some bureaucrat to make the decision. I have no defense against it except flight. There's no possible way to beat them at it, as everybody now understands. You can quote the Constitution until you're blue in the face. Nothing makes any difference to them. They've got you. Well, I consider that to be a, a cloud, at least a cloud, that I, I would prefer not to be there. Uh, but in the meantime, I stretch it as far as I can. Uh, yeah, but I, I, I think there's something to working for the, uh, for the abolition of slavery, because the slave people, uh, they have hungry eyes, you know, and they, uh, they may put up with a few nuts, but you just can't tell. I mean, I, I that's a nervous part. And I hate being nervous. I'm not excessively so, but. I've arranged to do a radio program from my cell. Uh, and there's always another book to be written. And if they choose to pay for my time, I, it's not the worst deal in the world. But I'd, I'd hate to leave home for that long. 
so it's it's a problem. It really is a problem. Yeah. Well, if we've solved all of those problems, <laughs> I, uh, this was a, such a uh, what I've talked about tonight is so personal that I can't really expect it to have been uh, terribly useful. I'll be talking about much more concrete things and things that have more general application in the in the next uh, uh, periods. Uh, but this was just an introduction to me, not to any philosophy, just to me. Thanks a lot. <laughs>